So I'm Coburn Watson, glad to be here. I work for Netflix, and I'm going to talk about um, a large cloud footprint and how to keep it in check, if I can get this to work. Uh, rate me. I'd love to hear what you think, um, whether you think it went well or poorly. Um, so I'm Coburn W. I manage the performance and reliability team at Netflix. I've been there for about three years. I worked with Adrian there for a period of time. Um, my organization handles a fair amount of things in the area of performance and reliability, primarily on the cloud component. So we reduce time to detect and time to resolve. So our major goal is to improve the availability of the service for Netflix end users. Um, does anybody use Netflix here? All right, higher than I thought. I don't know. There are there are people, but we'll, we have plans. Um, um, as a team, we uh, <laughs> we build a lot of tooling on my performance team. We optimize usage of the cloud. I'm going to talk today um, from a lean perspective, primarily around efficiency of our cloud footprint and some of the strategies we have there. I have a team that steers global traffic, so we also own a number of the monkeys down here. There's Chaos Kong, that's the big one, and then we own Chaos Monkey within the team. Kong is where we actually take traffic and shift it from one AWS region to another, and we do that about once a month, and we run it through peak, and then we fail it back. And so um, we use a combination of rerouting and DNS to do that. Um, we also use that to inject chaos in the environment. Yesterday, in the papers we love, there was a discussion about failure injection, and we do that quite a bit where we actually um, exercise our services on a daily basis to make sure that we can short circuit them out of there, and I'll cover that. And then we drive best practice adoption, um, but I'm not talking about that today. So as a company, we have about, we're approaching 70 million subscribers in over 50 countries. Um, back to the value that, you know, what, what our value is as a company, which is fairly commonly shared internally, is we want to win moments of truth. So when you sit down in your living room and you have the choice of selecting something to watch, we would hope that you select Netflix. And that's, that's our goal at the end of the day, is to make it a very great experience in terms of content for you to drive to. And it's great to make money at it as well. Um, <clears throat> we do about three billion hours of video a month right now. Uh, we have a pretty big cloud footprint. I'm going to talk about that. We have our own uh, homegrown CDN, so we deliver about 99%, a little more of our content off of a um, free BSD-based appliance that we generate, and we, or we create, and we give it to people if they want it. Um, in the US, I think we're close to 37% of the internet traffic at night. We've just passed porn, which is a big, <laughs> big, big milestone for us. Um, we've got to, got to keep that difference there. Um, and we have, a, <laughs> we have a strong original slate. So from a content perspective, I enjoy a lot of these, but we continue to release uh, more and more shows. Um, we're, we're releasing more and more originals that are regional specific. Um, and then we try to get global rights. So we just released one from Mexico as an example that's global, which I think it's a great show. Our open source um, offerings are a big focus of what we, we do as a company. I, I hand-picked a bunch of them out of here. Um, Atlas is our large monitoring framework. It collects somewhere on the order of about two billion time series a minute from our cloud. Um, and it lets, makes it queryable. There's usually about a two minute, minute to two minute delay and um, you get response times in about three seconds for most of your queries. So it's very efficient from that perspective. Um, if people have heard of Asgard, that's sort of our Amazon Web Services console replacement for infrastructure as a service. There's going to be some great news this fall, knock on something, that we're going to be releasing a new open source project, which is our continuous delivery framework that takes Asgard, but it's like on steroids. It's really awesome. Um, so keep your, keep your eyes out for that. ICE is where we look at our cost. So we get a big Amazon bill each month. I think at the end of the month, it's somewhere on the order of maybe like 400 million lines, and we consume it, and then we generate it into nice, pretty graphs and data to understand where our cost is. Vector is a performance tool my team created, which is um, on host high resolution metrics. Check it out, it's a lot of fun. And Hystrix uh, is our framework for dependency commands. So when we talk about letting services fail, Hystrix is the framework that lets you um, open circuits. When a service is misbehaving, I'm just gonna pick a water here. Um, when you open a circuit, you stop talking to that service and you throw a fallback. I don't have any examples here, but a good example would be you see your personalized rows, and when that service has a problem, you see unpersonalized rows. And we're actually, that uh, lineage-based uh, lineage fault injection, we're working with that, one of those professors from Berkeley on that right now. So 
I want to talk about our priorities as a company. I think in general, when you look at the engineering efforts, you have priorities in your organization. If you're a keep the lights on organization, maybe you have a product you just want to maintain, sustain, uh, continue to get maintenance revenue off of. When I was at HP, that was a number of our products. Um, I don't think a lot of you are in that space. So at Netflix, we prioritize in this way from top to bottom. So innovation is really our foundation. We feel that if we don't innovate quickly, think about Adrian's discussion of the hypothesis-based testing. There's 500 tests, 1,000 tests going on every day. Um, if we don't innovate, we're not going to win in the space, and that's key to us. And that's probably 80% um, you know, of our investment engineering-wise is in innovation. Uh, Reliability is on top of that. If the service isn't available, then it's not much use. And then efficiency is up there at the top. And so I, I sort of hang out in the upper two. I don't spend as much part on the lower um, innovation area. And there's not many of us that spend time in the efficiency space, which is where I think we're fairly lean. Um, so we try to do it um, behind the scenes, and I'll go into that a bit. But the organization recognizes um, that these are both important, and so everybody's a stakeholder in the game, freedom and responsibility. Uh, it's just that there's fewer of us trying to move the needle forward on those. So those previous, those two on the bottom there, um, innovation and reliability have costs associated with them, and that can lead to significant inefficiency. So I'm going to talk about how we maximize innovation. Here's a little sub-screenshot of our new continuous delivery tool. We make capacity on demand for all Netflix engineers. There's a little box that pops up. If you want 1,000 instances, you just type in 1,000 instances, and they show up in production. Um, so our commit to cloud goal is to let people get their code out there in a matter of minutes. Um, we have this gigantic single production account. It allows us to maximize reuse, which I'm going to talk about. It also simplifies how we purchase capacity. But by being in one big account, um, it just allows people to have the capacity they want. And we also burst into on-demand. So I want to make sure that people understand we depend on the elasticity of the cloud. We have a certain percentage we try to keep it under. But in general, on any daily basis, you know, we're probably going into on-demand some percent. And then we backfill on top of that. So you might see that this could actually introduce some fairly significant cost risk um, if there weren't some strategies to constrain it. Reliability um, brings with it a lot of costs as well. right? We have a red-black push model. So when you push your code to production through Asgard or through our new tool that's coming out, um, you'll actually stand up a new version of your code, direct traffic to it, tear down the old one. If something goes wrong, you just point the traffic back right away and you deal with it the next day. So having that overlap of capacity, you need to be efficient in it, but still it's additional capacity. Um, we have multiple levels of redundancy in our system. Um, within an AWS region, we actually over-provision across three availability zones to support the loss of one of them. So you have about a 50% additional capacity in each AZ. And that, again, is more capacity you have to buy. And then the big, um, one of the big spend areas is our global redundancy. So as I talked about, we exercise this capability once a month of failing user traffic back and forth between regions. This year, we're actually working on failing it across the three re regions equivalently by, um, by Christmas time. So that's our, our next big goal. But when you think about it, um, we purchase these heavy reservations to cover our capacity. Um, I call them guarantees. I don't know if Amazon refers to them as guarantees necessarily. But you want to have the capacity there when you're at our scale that when you fail over, it's available. So we actually have enough capacity behind the scenes in the regions to support failure of our load from any region to another at any given time. It's, it's something we pay for uh, 24 by 7. Now, purchasing heavy reservations has some implications in that you're actually paying an upfront cost, um, usually for like a three-year reservation. And then you're paying a 24 by 7 fee whether you use that capacity or not. And the reason we do that besides for reliability is um, it gets us probably a 70 plus percent discount. I'm giving you the low end there. But it actually, compared to on demand, it's a big uh, financial savings as long as you use it. Um, otherwise, you're just paying for stuff you aren't using. So bucket of cash falling over uh, if you don't keep an eye on it. So those are the two big cost implications of how we maximize our velocity for engineers. Efficiency. So at the top of the mountain, I'm going to talk about how we look at efficiency, how we set goals, and some of the strategies we put in place to control that, right? I said not control that, guided along, context. Um, so having these efficiency goals is really key. I've obfuscated some of the metrics here, but at the top we have our KPI, right, which is you probably can assume it has something to do with streaming, right? Because that, that's sort of, or it could be logging, because we're a big logging framework too. You probably tracks right with it. Um, and then what we do is we decompose cost by, um, these are at the 
I think the director level, and this is based on I status. So we get the Amazon billing file, we feed it through a system, it goes into Hive, we generate Tableau reports on top of it. Um, and what this shows is your cost contribution to the cloud cost overall as a function of your key performance indicator. And you can see how it shoots up and then suddenly there's a big spike in our activity and suddenly it goes down and it, and it fluctuates a bit. And so this gives individuals at the highest level of the organization the context to understand what percentage of the spend they are and if it's tracking with the business metrics or not. And this gets published weekly. Um, there's also another tab you'll click on. It'll show absolute cost so you can see how much you actually cost. So that's really handy. Um, and it, there's a lot of discussions about VPs saying, hey, look how much you cost. Look how much I cost. And it's sort of... I think it creates a little gaming system there um, between, the, with, between the divisions, which is good. Um, it's healthy, healthy competition. But usually once someone realizes that their cost profile is not what they want it to be, the first thing they do is they turn to the engineering managers under them and they say, what is going on here? Like, why are we growing so fast? And so this was our first cut and we thought we had it pretty, pretty good. But what we realized was that to be effective, we had to push that cost context uh, down to the engineering managers at the first level and their teams and the services they own because they can't, <laughs> Barry's like, yeah. And so, you know, they would turn to their managers and say, why did we grow 30% over the past week or month or what have you? So we leveraged some ICE data um, and then internally we use our Atlas monitoring system which tracks uh, instance, instances used by our, by auto scaling group. And then we use a normalized cost. We don't want to penalize someone for on demand. So there's a normalized cost in here. But if I was an engineering manager and I received this, this gets sent out um, monthly, I would see that my services together cost about close to $2 million a year. And here's my distribution of my services. And think of microservices. We've grouped them behind the scenes. So a microservice might be, say, a servlet tier plus memcache plus Cassandra. And we sort of lump them. So we have this mapping behind the scenes that lets us aggregate it. And we maintain that in the reporting system. And so they can pretty easily see what the largest cost component is of their footprint. Um, they actually see month over month what the change was. So this one dropped by 7%, whereas this one went up by 23%. And so it lets them start to understand where that spend is going. If they click on one of the um, items on the left where they can do a breakout, they'll actually get it broken down by those tiers I talked about, you know, the service tier, Memcache, Cassandra, and they can actually see which element is growing within there. When I first started doing this a couple years ago, you know, I, I, someone's like, hey, our cost is running off in the weeds. Why don't you figure that out? So I'd go to ICE and I'd start pulling down all this data, get some CSVs, I'd start generating spreadsheets, and I'd say, here's where, we're, here's where we're spending, right? And in about two weeks, it was completely invalid because in our architecture and the rate at which people push, it's only valid for a couple days, right? And, and it could be there was an instance running around for an A-B test and then it went away. So we found that we had to make sure we had a system that was generating this dynamically and updating it, otherwise it was always out of date. So as you increase your velocity um, of your engineering efforts, you have to increase the velocity of your tracking and cost tools as well, or else it's just gonna be a monthly spreadsheet. And people are like, you know, first thing they'll say is, oh, we aren't using that much anymore, right? But again, it's sort of that context over control. We try to push the data to the teams. They can make better decisions. And we see that in most cases, uh, most cases they do. Maximizing sharing. So when I talked about buying reservations, so um, in terms of the size of our footprint, I try not to give exact numbers. But across the three regions, we, we run somewhere between, say, 50 and 100,000 instances in a given day on Amazon of all different sizes. Um, reservations are by, uh, I didn't ask, who, who uses Amazon here? Seem, okay, so you guys, to moderate level, know the terminology. So for EC2, which is the compute, that's our biggest component we use. Um, if I go to Amazon and I say, I want to buy an instance from you, and I'm going to pay you upfront for three years to get this great discount, they say, great, no problem. What region, what instance type, what availability zone? So you suddenly have a lock-in where if someone goes and uses another instance type in another AZ, I can't leverage that capacity for their service because it's very finely fine-grained um, in how the accounting is performed. So another reason, that's why we have a single production account. We have all these people pushing on a regular basis they can share with each other. Um, and we have fewer larger pools. Since people are doing red-black pushes on a daily basis, some teams are doing it on a daily basis. Some are doing it maybe once or twice a week outside of that. 
they have these bursts into the pools, and we end up having capacity and discount to cover that. So we don't micromanage it. I don't look, I don't like look at people and say, well, you're going to push today, but they're pushing tomorrow. We just assume if we do burst beyond that, we go into on demand, and that's the benefit of the cloud for us. And so we maximize that shared capacity. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but if you look at all of Amazon's EC2 offerings, 75% of our uh, reservations are only on eight EC2 instance types. And these could be like M3XL, M3X, you know, M3 large. Um, we have some big ones in there as well. But uh, this helps us behind the scenes manage fewer larger pools. And I think in the next couple years, um, Adrian mentioned we have a Mesos uh, scheduler-based framework that does some of our batch activity. We're actually considering looking out a year or two how we can um, containerize a large part of our workload and actually abstract a lot of this away. I have some concern, you know, I mean, I have some benefits around workload preemption, shared capacity, but from a um, instance migration planning, when we migrate instances today, it's a real pain. It makes us less agile and it's sort of a hassle to go to a team and say, hey, Amazon's released a new instance type. It's time to spend a bunch of time getting you onto the new instance type and we want to get away from that. But um, that's just another aspect of having sharing and this is updated fairly dynamically. So we build a lot of these little tools that give visibility to teams. And you can drill down on the ASG, on the, you know, the, the different zones, but it gives that real-time view for everybody to look at um, where their capacity is outlaid. So we encourage borrowing. And borrowing goes beyond just within the single prod account. So when you set up a set of Amazon accounts for your business, yesterday someone mentioned, I think the DevSecOps talked that they had 1,400 accounts for security purposes. That might be a little complex to accomplish what we did in terms of linking, but Amazon will give you a consolidated bill. And when you set up your accounts, before you launch the first instance, you want to say to the AWS people, make sure that these accounts have my availability zones lining up. Because what happens then is when I purchase a reservation in prod, if I have a linked account like my encoding account that's doing uh, video encoding, if they launch an instance in the same availability zone, during that period, and I'm not using that reservation in the prod account, I get the billing benefit. So that's what we call our internal spot market, and we really try to maximize that. That's how we recover a lot of that cost of 24 by 7. So, I'm sorry. Um, we dynamically auto scale. This is a period of a week, if you guys can see it. That's one of our big online services that um, is running every day in one region, US East. This is in US East 1. They did a push here, that's why it changed colors. You can see there is an overlap of capacity. But they basically reactively auto-scale with load. We also have something we haven't open sourced, but Adrian or someone mentioned, which is our predictive auto-scaling engine. So we run like FFT, look at the previous week's workload, set them in, set our floor for these to a certain value. And so for the most part, we have almost as much capacity as we need on a given daily basis. And then we can burst beyond that if we need it. But if you look at these gigantic troughs, um, over here, that's 500 up to about 2,700. And these are pretty big, like 16 vCPU systems. And so all of, this, all of this dead space in here is capacity that we've paid for that we're not using. And so my VP looks to me and says, Coburn, why are we not using that capacity? And that becomes a challenge. <laughs> that becomes a challenge for me <laughs> because then I have to turn to other teams and say, why can't you help me use this capacity? And we've recently created a new API that actually allows a user to consume um, all of the reservation usage, all of the on-demand usage, and the billing data, or sort of the borrowing data, so they can actually look real-time, semi-real-time, and say, hey, this AZ has a bunch of spare capacity, and the encoding team will spin up a bunch of jobs. And then every five minutes, they'll look to see if that buffer is getting too small, and they'll tear it down. This, uh, this auto-scaling group on the bottom, that's a pre-compute service. So every day, Netflix calculates your recommendations. It's probably no surprise but you can see that it fits in the trough in general. Now this is fairly primitive in that it's a scheduled action within Amazon and we just stand it up and tear it down, but they're almost not overlapping for a large amount of the capacity. I don't have the data for the borrowed accounts, um, say our data eng, which runs large Hadoop jobs, or our encoding account, which encodes the video, but if you overlaid that, you would see a lot more of this spare capacity um, going away, which, which is really what we, we shoot for. Um, and they get that billing benefit. And that's over about a week. So optimization plays a part in it. So I have the performance engineering team as well. And we do direct consultation for really big services. We have about 
400 microservices and uh, their distribution of size, um, there's probably 10% which represents, say, 50% of the capacity. When they have a big shift, we get engaged with them and help optimize. For the rest of them, we create tooling so they can look at um, the performance of their service whenever they want. Because uh, in Netflix, every engineering team, there's probably about 40 engineering teams that own these 400 microservices. Everybody has someone on call. They handle their design, development, operation, push, page. Like, I don't own anybody's operational stuff for their services, right? Like, I'm sort of a coordination point for reliability. But every team owns every aspect. They can implement it in JavaScript. They can use Clojure. They can use Scala. It doesn't matter, right? Um, we are heavily JVM-based. But um, having that decoupling allows everybody to handle their own operational aspects. Here's an example of two separate flows. The one on the left is when you have a new feature or a new service coming out. And that tends to be a little bit more of a special case in which it's developed, it's deployed. We keep a little closer eye on it. And as we scale it up, we optimize if needed. Sometimes at our current scale, there are services which come out of the gate that are very inefficient. And we have to get in and profile um, and optimize in a number of ways. The one on the right is day-to-day -day development. So, you develop your code, you push it through a red-black, but as part of that, through our continuous delivery framework, you have a canary. And our automated canary analysis framework is sort of our gate for a production push. Teams adopt it to various levels. That edge team I showed you here that scales up to 3,000 instances, that's our most complex service. They sit on the edge. You know, Tens of millions of devices are talking to it every day. They have to incorporate about 700 jar files every time they build from all the clients that they talk to uh, in the architecture. They push every day, um, in most cases. I grabbed last week, they had an issue. But in general, they push every 24 hours on a schedule. It goes out, so that, that tier gets replaced every day. And it rolls in a global way across the uh, production environment. Um, but we run canaries. That helps with efficiency as well, because we don't stand everything up and see if it fails. We you know, stand up a canary and a baseline. The edge team probably has about 3,000 metrics that they've grouped into various categories, and they have a score. And if that score, I think, is below 70%, the push won't go out. If the score is above 70%, the push goes out. And they fine-tuned it over time. But it automates it, and it rolls it. And the canary, oh, the, uh, the canary will catch both functional and performance deviations, right? L like big bang performance deviations are things that we catch right away. And then we optimize before they actually deploy it out so they don't cause any capacity issues. But it's up to the teams to implement canary analysis and catch that on their watch. So um, we tend to be too big for most commercial tools. We've, we've brought a few in before. We've killed, we've killed them. Um, and I don't, not in a bad way, right? I mean, we're sort of their performance lab. If you have these 50 plus thousand things, somewhere between 50 and 100,000 running, it's a lot of data for, peop for these systems to consume. And the systems themselves tend to have um, very broad use cases, right? We want to create a CTO dashboard. And we also want to show you response time and look at your RUM data. And we tend to have very specialized use cases around, hey, I have an engineering team that wants to look at the uh, transaction flow across tiers using a framework that's much like Google's Dapper, has you know, response time information, transaction tracing. This, uh, this utility slalom that the performance team created actually shows demand on a service. This is a function of your request rate and your response time. You can double click on the bar, and it will show you your demand from upstream into your downstream microservices. And it lets you see the flow through the environment. The, the value here is if I needed to optimize my service, I can fairly quickly understand how much time is spent in my service versus my dependencies and go work on those optimizations as need be. But you know, this, probably, this view right here probably incorporates maybe, I want to say about 9,000 instances worth of data, and it aggregates it up. Um, on the right, sometimes we find there are aspects of our stack which don't give us the visibility we want. Um, Brendan Gregg's on my performance team. You might have heard of him. He does a lot of performance work. And he gets very frustrated when he has to use multiple tools to solve a problem. Like, hey, I'm going to go use Perf to look at system data. And then I'm going to go find out where CPU time is spent in the JVM. So I'm going to install an agent. And I'm going to start using this profiler. And he gets really frustrated because he just wants to do it from the system level all the way through system and user space. right? So he, uh, he started doing some sampling against um, the JVM. And all this used to be blank in here, this green stuff. That's user space code. And the problem was, was that the JVM clobbers the frame pointer registry. It's an old optimization. But as a result, you get the stack frames from Perf. You can't really reassemble an accurate stack of where time is spent. So he went in um, about six months ago, and he found the, 
assembly code where that was happening and he changed it and he started working with the Sun Hotspot developers on the, on the mailing list and got the patch in. So I think two weeks ago, Sun released Java 8 update 60 and now you can um, run with a certain XX flag and you actually can get the full stack traces, right? There's full stack frames. And then you can also run a mapping agent that shows you addresses to memory. So you can actually generate this in a really lightweight fashion and see where all your CPU time is spent on your system from system through user space. So that's an example of creating a custom tool sometimes by, I, I didn't think we'd get it through Oracle, but we did. Um, so they obviously thought it was high value and it was a simple change, but we're very happy now that we have that because that eliminates a lot of workarounds we had to do before with multiple tools. Um, he's blogged about it quite a bit, so you can actually check that out. Um, one last thing I wanted to call out is in our, in our goal of being lean, right? we, we want to purchase capacity, we want to have these reservations to make sure that the capacity is there and we need it, which can lead to waste, but we don't want to overstep. Sometimes you'll have teams that will come to us and say, hey, I did a push today and I couldn't get you know, an R3 8XL for some reason in one availability zone. And the answer is really, we're not going to purchase so much capacity that we're never going to have what's called an ICE, not the ICE tool, but an insufficient capacity exception. So we built a tool that layers on, I think it consumes cloud trail events through another utility we have inside called Kronos, which is our auditing framework. But the, um, the capacity team actually gets reports that shows when we're getting iced and what availability zone. If it starts to be sort of a major situation where we can't get a consistent instance type we want in a certain availability zone, um, we'll open up a ticket with Amazon and have a discussion with them and there might be a shortfall. It also gives us good visibility into when our uh, uh, deployment model is changing and we need to start purchasing more reservations in that family. But the data around these ICE events is actually available for you directly from Amazon. So it's handy to keep an eye on. Um, so it was mentioned that I should talk about some wins, like actually put some data in here. I tried to be a little bit loose. But in terms of internal borrowing, so this is a big deal for us because we've been working on this for probably two years. Uh, I've, been had, I've had some requests for me for a while to make this happen, but I've had dependencies on other teams being able to consume the capacity. But our encoding team, uh, we had a data point from June. So they used about 132, 135,000 instance hours from the product count that they didn't really have to pay for. If they had had to buy that capacity, they would have had to spend about $200,000 a month. So that was a pretty big savings and we had already paid for it. So we actually still paid the 200,000, but it just didn't go away un, uh, unused. Our data platform team, the Hadoop team that uses EMR, they, um, they're switching instance families. So this might not still be the case, but they were saving on the order of about a million dollars a year by standing up a custom cluster at night to run very special jobs. They called it the super cluster. Uh, and then they would tear it down at a certain time in the morning. So this is an example of you buy the reservations, you lay the cash out for it, but then you make sure behind the scenes that you get teams who are interested in leveraging that. It's basically free for them. And it looks great because it doesn't show up. Well, it, the reserved hourly rate shows up in their chart, but it's not the same as the amortized sort of upfront plus reserved. So sort of funny math inside, but teams love borrowing this capacity. Um, nobody's used it for Bitcoin or anything. <laughs> There's a lot of it there. I think we. <laughs> Just create an application called something unique, Coburn's app. Um, so in summary, um, I think it's really important, and we did this, we've done this for a while now, is to figure out what that balance is of your innovation versus your efficiency, right? As an organization, you're going to put more focus on one or the other. Innovation, hands down, is what we're focusing on. I try to stay as much as possible out of the way of innovation. My goal is to get engineers capacity when they need it, when they want it, and as much as they want. And then behind the scenes, I wouldn't call it playing games, but get the context, balance all of these uh, different dependencies and make sure that we're efficient at the end of the day. And it's more of a soft goal for us. Like if I don't meet my efficiency goal, I don't think I'm gonna get fired. Um, but it's something where it gives, us a, it gives us a target to shoot for. And when I have a discussion with managers, I can talk about a concrete goal. So it's probably not a real surprise, but it's good to understand where you fall on that spectrum. Pushing that data down to the team level, you really want the individuals who are closest to the deployment model to understand what their cost is. We find a lot of cases where someone doesn't have an efficient, say, deployment pipeline. They might be doing it manually. They stand up a service or an ASG. They stand up another auto-scaling group. They forget about it, and it's running out there, right? This sort of data helps them determine how to become more efficient in their development models. And it's not like a, you know, a finger wag at them. It's just like, hey, here's your data, and most people act on it appropriately. Um, I think, was it Ralph Waldo Emerson said, um, 
the cloud is not a destination, it's a journey or something along those lines. It's probably life. But uh, for us, it's really been a journey. Adrian was there, gave birth, birth to this Netflix cloud baby. Um, and that was somewhere in the 2009, 2010 timeframe. And just this year, we're getting our final application out of the data center. So it has been a journey. Uh, and so when we talk about this stuff, sometimes people become a little bit awe, in awe of how we do all this at this scale. Um, it's been a process, right? It's something that takes a bit of time. And so you know, don't focus on efficiency so much day one. But as you go in over time, build up that uh, strategy and those tools to help you achieve um, what you need to do as a business. And there's a Netflix spaceship taking off. Please rate the session, um, and I'll see you tonight if you have any questions.